Welcome to the Strangeology Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Foran. From cryptozoology, ufology, and the paranormal, to legends, forbidden history, and more. Listen in and explore the world of the weird and unexplained. Join me as I look into strange and fascinating tales and unearth the truths and theories behind some of the world's greatest mysteries. Be sure to head on over to our HQ, strangeology.com, where you can check out our blog, episodes archive, gift shop, and so much more. Now sit back, relax, and join me as we get weird. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Strangeology Podcast, Season 2, Episode 10. This is the 30th episode of the show all together. So after taking a couple of unplanned weeks off here, I guess it's almost been a month since my last episode. Jeez, sorry guys. In case you're wondering where I've been, a lot of my energy between like late March and all of April and the beginning of May uh, had been going into busting out tons of TikTok videos in tandem with designs for my home state cryptids map and uh, t-shirt design project, which, uh, spoiler alert, I finally filled out all the designs for, which is awesome. I still have a few uh, to actually get up in the shop and f- actually finish out t-shirt designs for. Uh, but yeah, things were going pretty viral there for a hot minute, but uh, things have tapered off now for the time being, which I'm totally okay with. Making that much short form content in such a short period of time can really burn you out quick when you have other stuff going on too. So uh, I've been taking a little bit of a break from that so I could focus on uh, the podcast episode. And if you're wondering, um, also, yes, I will be releasing the Homestake Cryptids and Legends map. Uh, as a large print on my shop very soon. I've been getting tons of requests for that. Uh, So don't worry, that will be available. Uh, Although I do kind of want to double back and add a few more designs uh, for some states that I didn't touch on. Uh, Mainly like Goatman type designs because I don't have any (laughs) on the map. And people have been asking where's like the Poplick Monster and the Maryland Goatman. Uh, So I think I'll probably add a couple more before I actually put the map up for availability to purchase. Uh, Beyond staying busy with all of that, uh, you got to deal as a parent, (laughs) you got to deal with your kiddo getting sick from time to time. And there was like a two week period where uh, he couldn't go into daycare because he had a cold. (laughs) So we were busy taking care of him and my available time to dedicate for researching and writing this episode was super reduced while taking care of the family along with trying to knock out important yard projects before the summer kicks into high gear and it gets just too hot to do anything outside. Uh, But hey, we're here now, we're doing this thing, and it's going to be epic because I put a bunch of time into researching for this episode today, and I think you're going to like it. But before we get started, uh, in other news, the podcast recently passed 20,000 downloads, which is awesome. So thank you everyone out there for checking out my show and uh, helping us uh, get to the next level and uh, listening and sharing it with your friends. It helps me out so much when you do that. So let's uh, keep this thing chugging along. And I didn't have an entirely unproductive couple of weeks uh, in in terms of content. I actually uploaded a new YouTube edit over on my YouTube channel all about the history of the Rougarou. And uh, I've also been uploading shorts there as well. The same kind of stuff that I was posting to TikTok, the same videos, just kind of repurposing it for YouTube shorts. And I had a short about the Rougarou that kind of got a bunch of views. So I decided to do a longer form uh, video on that. So if you're ever wondering where the podcast has gone and where I've been, you can always check the YouTube channel because there might be a new video (laughs) over there. Uh, And you'll definitely know if you follow me over on uh, Instagram 
uh, or Facebook. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate if, uh, all y'all can check out my channel there too to help get my watch time up and take things to the next step over there. I recently passed 2,000 subscribers there as well, which is really awesome. It's like the last like few couple months I've hit some some pretty awesome milestones. So I appreciate the support so much, everyone, and uh, you have my thanks. So I'll put the uh, the links in the show notes for all that, uh, as always. So that's enough of that. Uh, why don't we get into today's episode? And if you read the title, yeah, we're we're going there. We're <laughs> we're diving into the conspiracy theory of the hollow Earth. Let's go. <music> Okay, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the hollow earth theory before, but just for a brief overview for those of you who haven't heard of it or are not too familiar about what this uh, this crazy topic is that I'm about to get into here. So hollow earth is basically the idea or conspiracy theory that <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's something that uh, kind of a, an uncomfortable amount of people believe in, right? Where flat earthers believe that the earth is literally a flat disk encased in this dome called the firmament, hollow earthers believe that the planet earth that we live on, it's a sphere, but it's an empty shell with this Garden of Eden-like paradise in the inner part of the shell. Some of the theories talk about it having this inner sun because you need daylight, but then again, I wonder... Is there ever a nighttime? I suppose some people say it's always daytime there <laughs> and everything's just hunky dory. Uh, and there's supposed to be these openings at the North and South Poles that are around 1400 miles across where one could apparently access the inner earth. And there's supposed to also be a third entrance in Tibet. Uh, in the Himalayas near Mount Kailash, uh, which goes into the whole legend of Shambhala or Agartha and the, the whole King of the World story, which I covered on a Patreon episode last year. I think it was the one where I talked about the uh, supposed ancient Egyptian city in the Grand Canyon. And there's also supposed to be other uh, like cavern systems and, and caves that can potentially lead someone to uh, the inner or hollow earth. Anyway, a according to this theory, the edge of the pole isn't like this drop off like the edge of the world, like in flat earth theory. It's, it's supposed to be a kind of curve around the shell to the hollow earth. It's kind of like this torus shape. And apparently if you sailed a boat or flew a plane through this, it's kind of like an ant going around the lip of uh, a plate or your desk uh, <laughs> or kitchen table, for instance. And the size of it would would make it so that you wouldn't even notice the change from the exterior world into the interior world. But Apparently, there's supposed to be some kind of invisible force that prevents anyone from actually being able to make it through and instead turns them back around unless you are uh, some kind of chosen person that's allowed to come through the, uh, the portal, if you will. So there are people today that uh, wholeheartedly believe this theory uh, that the inner earth is exists and it's inhabited with creatures from prehistoric times like dinosaurs and megafauna and flora and that there's this utopian civilization with a uh, several races of highly advanced technological beings down there that live these incredibly long lifespans some think that they could be a human-like breakaway civilization they could be Lemurians or Atlanteans as well. There's even theories that talk about uh, Hitler and the Nazis having escaped Germany after World War II to the hollow earth, which is totally ridiculous. <laughs> or aliens like the dreaded reptilians, and they're behind uh, a good portion of the UFO sightings that 
people report every year and may even be responsible for directing humanity's development over the eons. But <laughs> we have a, a three-dimensional digital reconstruction of what the Earth looks like with Google Earth, and <laughs> there's no holes at the poles, Jeff, you say. Well, obviously, they're just photoshopped out to maintain the cover-up by the powers that be because... The the government definitely knows, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, we're having fun here. So basically, the theory disregards all science that we know now, uh, although it's kind of based on early ideas and theories of the world and how it was structured that have since been proven false by early uh, theologians and scientists from the, uh, the Age of Enlightenment. You know, a planet physically, as far as we know, can't really be hollow without the mass that uh, is the entirety of the crust, mantle, and core, all that gives. Like, gravity would be <laughs> incredibly weak, so much so that you might just be able to, like, yeet yourself a few hundred feet into the air, or even maybe out into space. I'm just guessing. <laughs> I don't actually know the physics behind that one, or what, what fraction of gravity there would be if, if it was actually this <laughs> shell of a planet. And even the idea of an inner star or sun, which isn't too dissimilar from our own solid planetary core... But, like, what kind of star would that be? Some kind of neutron star? Surely the gravity from something that dense would just collapse the whole shell of the planet into it. <laughs> and before that, it would also burn and irradiate anything on the inside of the shell. But just for fun, let's uh, suspend our disbelief today and see where this theory comes from. So, what are the origins of this theory? You can trace these ideas far back into mythology and legends of ancient cultures that spoke of an underworld. The ancient Greeks had Hades. The Norse had Svartal fame. Christianity, of course, has Hell. Judaism has Sheol. The ancient Mayans had Zabalba. Ancient Egypt had Duat. Tibetan Buddhists have Shambhala and Agartha, like I mentioned before. The Hopi people of the American Southwest have legends of emerging from the underworld as well as the Iroquois or even the Inca from South America. I could go on. <laughs> the point is that the concept that there is an unknown place under our feet is not a new one and it's widely shared by pretty much every culture in the world. And according to these old legends, there's usually a physical way to get there. It's not really supposed to be part of some other plane of existence in a lot of these stories, uh, interdimensional or otherwise, but there are some that are, it's, you know, not part of this <laughs> three-dimensional existence that we live in. For the Greeks, uh, they believed that there's large caverns under the surface where one could find entrances leading to their underworld and even had mapped out several cave systems in the real world around their country that they believed housed these entrances. And there's also Celtic legends that you can find that talk about these, uh, these entrances. There's a place called Kruahan Cave, probably butchered that, I hope I got it right, <laughs> which is called Ireland's Gate to Hell, as well as a cave system in County Donegal in Ireland where supposedly knights and saints would make pilgrimages to and they would enter into this purgatory type place. And then in Northern Ireland, there's a further legend of a subterranean land called Tua de Donan, where this group of people lived that, according to legend, introduced Druidism to Ireland, and then these people just disappeared back to their underground civilization, never to be seen again. So while there's millennia worth of legends and folklore about the underworld, it wasn't until the 17th century that early scientists started taking this idea into consideration when trying to figure out the state of the Earth. In 1692, the scientist Edmund Haley first proposed the idea of the hollow Earth theory. 
Halley is credited for calculating the elliptical orbit of a certain comet of the same name and that comes periodically and passes by Earth every 70 or so years. Now, Halley, of course, was an astronomer, but was also a physicist, a meteorologist, and a mathematician, along with being a good friend of the one and only Sir Isaac Newton. And Halley's biggest interest was actually magnetic declination or the difference in location between the uh, magnetic north and true or geographic north of the world. If he could solve this puzzle, he would have been able to advance navigation at sea, which would lead to less ships getting lost. And after taking measurements from different parts of the world over a span of decades, he determined that the Earth's magnetic field is actually unstable and constantly shifting, which is true. And in fact, the the magnetic north pole is actually moving very rapidly in uh, another direction right now into a completely different spot on the planet. So Haley then hypothesized that something must be moving underground and formed the idea that the Earth consisted of this 500-mile-thick hollow shell. Inside, there would be two concentric and possibly inhabited inner shells and an innermost core as well. According to his theory, each shell had its own magnetic poles and atmospheres, and they were also a little bit misaligned from one another, which was what caused the disruption of the outer Earth's magnetic field. And this is interesting because although it's wrong, the concept is really similar to what we know today, which is that the Earth's core is made up of different layers or zones. Under the crust, which we live on, is the Earth's mantle, and then the fluid outer core, and then the solid inner core. Uh, So the Earth is kind of, it kind of has layers. It's like an onion. (laughs) Uh, But not in the way that Haley was envisioning. And our outer core is full of nickel and iron, which is churning through the geodynamo effect and creates the Earth's magnetic field along with its constantly fluctuating uh, locations and variations. And another thing to note is that he also thought that the Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights, uh, was this luminous atmosphere from the inner Earth that would escape periodically. And this idea actually has persisted uh, into more modern uh, hollow Earth theories. Some people do believe that the Northern Lights are proof of a hollow Earth. Okay, so the next guy that we're going to talk about is Leonard Euler. And he's often credited as being one of the early intellectuals to propose and also modify this hollow Earth theory. And it's claimed that he suggested that the Earth was made up of a single shell and brought in the idea of an inner sun to the mix. And you see this guy being referenced on shows like Ancient Aliens and even in his own contemporaries back in the 1700s. And apparently there's not a lot of evidence out there proving that he came up with this idea. And instead, he likely just did a thought experiment which involved the dropping of an object into a hole that was drilled into the center of the Earth. And there wasn't actually any mention of the planet being hollow. And that... And that brings us to the next big figure that we're going to talk about for Hollow Earth. And this is the person who's largely credited as bringing this idea into more, I won't say mainstream, but having more visibility to the public and the world at large. This was uh, John Cleves Sims Jr. And uh, he, the town that he lived and died in, which was Hamilton, Ohio, 
actually has a monument to him as well as his theories about hollow earth that you can go and visit today. Sims was an army veteran and he was actually related to president Harrison, who was president in the 1840s. And after his time in the military, he moved to St. Louis in 1815 to become a trader. But after doing that for four years, his business failed. And so he uprooted his family and moved to Kentucky. During this time, he began formulating his hypothesis for the hollow earth, uh, apparently inspired by the rings of Saturn. So in Sim's original theory that he presented in 1818, he proposed that the idea of a hollow earth it consisted of these five concentric spheres with humanity being on the outermost layer. His idea also stated that because of the centrifugal force of the Earth's rotation, that the planet would actually be flattened at the poles where you would be able to find the entrances to the inner spheres. And later on, people would refer to these holes as Sims holes. <laughs> and I assume that the inner shells scale down in size and their openings all remain proportional. Before going on a lecture tour of the East Coast to talk about his theory, Sims dumped the whole concentric spheres idea and then just whittled it down to a single hollow shell which was around 800 miles thick with these 1400 mile openings across the north and south poles and he went on to suggest that all planets and celestial bodies are also hollow in nature which, thanks to modern astronomy and telescopes and all that, we know is 100% false And Sims even wanted to conduct an expedition to the North Pole to prove his theory, mostly at the urging of one of his most uh, devout followers, this, this guy named James McBride, who was his number one fanboy, I guess. <laughs> and interestingly, Sims never actually wrote any books about his theories on Hollow Earth, but he spent the rest of his life promoting the theory after his trading business failed. So it's like he'd get up on a soapbox and talk to people and try to meet with people in government. And because of this, a handful of authors wound up writing several books discussing his theories throughout the 1800s. Uh, James McBride, uh, his, his big fan being one of them. And that's how we know about his theories apparently. And there are uh, several other theorists that jumped on this bandwagon as well uh, over the decades that followed. Uh, but <laughs> I could go into more, but it would probably be another whole episode <laughs> about that. Uh, and then I, I wanted to throw this in here. Uh, there's this other idea that's kind of similar to Hollow Earth called the concave Earth theory, which was touted by this guy, Cyrus Teed, in the 1800s, uh, which is it's a similar theory. But instead of us being outside the shell, he claims that we're actually on the inner Earth and that the sun that we see in outer space that the planet orbits around is actually the center of the shell. It's the inner sun uh, and that half of it was lit up to make daylight <laughs> and the other half was dark. So it would like, I guess the shell would spin around or something like that. So we would get uh, night and day, or at least it would give the appearance of that. So even though we have, we can actually physically, you know, <laughs> see the sun setting because the earth rotates. It, it's <laughs> like batshit crazy stuff. <laughs> And I got to wonder if this guy ever actually watched a sunrise or a sunset. 
And he went on to start a cult and he changed his name to Koresh and he assumed the role of this cult's messiah, naturally. And he wound up buying a 300 acre plot of land in Florida and he kept trying to promote all these ideas of the concave earth and he wound up dying in 1908 and didn't prove any of his ideas, of course. (laughs) And now we're getting into the latter half of the 19th century and Sim's ideas on hollow earth have propagated around the world. And there's all these other theorists and authors writing about the idea and along comes Jules Verne, who, if you're not familiar, in 1864 published the novel Journey to the Center of the Earth. And, I mean, who hasn't heard of that one? (laughs) And in this story, it follows this eccentric German scientist, uh, Professor Otto Lindenbrock, on his quest to find the center of the Earth, believing that there are these volcanic tubes that will take him there. And on this journey, they find a whole subterranean ocean and prehistoric creatures and and this story went on to influence authors like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Edgar Rice Burroughs and others and popularized this whole genre of subterranean fiction with stories of prehistoric lands and fantastical events and ancient lost tribes of humans or advanced enlightened beings living in this inner world that we can't easily reach. And these ideas kept perpetuating into the 20th century as well, with several more authors adding in their own two cents to the situation, of course. Uh, The author William Reed wrote The Phantom of the Poles in 1906, which attempted to explain mysterious phenomena that was reported by polar explorers and purported that the earth was indeed hollow and you could gain access to the inside at the poles, but that some force kept people from crossing that threshold. He also believed the hollow earth was inhabited by unknown races of people and contained vast continents, oceans, mountains, and rivers, along with plentiful vegetation and animal life. However, after a few years, in 1909, this explorer, Admiral Peary, claimed to make it to the North Pole, and only two years after that, in 1911, another explorer, Roald Amundsen, was the first person to reach the South Pole, and they found no such entrances to the hollow earth. And then there's the German spiritualist writer, Welberga, Lady Paget, who was a close friend of Queen Victoria and had mentioned the hollow earth in her works and claimed that it existed beneath a desert and that this was where the people of Atlantis migrated to. She also predicted that the entrance to this place would be discovered sometime in the 21st century. So I guess the jury is still out on, uh, on this one. Maybe, maybe Atlantis will be, will be found sometime in the 21st century. Another author by the name of Marshall Gardner wrote a journey to the earth's interior in 1913 kind of building off sims idea although he apparently was critical of sims theories and made no mention of william reed throughout his thesis and then moving into the 20th century we have the author george papashvili totally butchered that name <laughs> And he wrote the book, Anything Can Happen, and talked about the entrance to the hollow earth being in the the Caucasus Mountains, where he claimed that there was this cavern discovered and there were remains of giant human skeletons and their heads were supposed to be as big as bushel baskets and that there was also this ancient tunnel in this cavern that led to the inner earth. And according to the story, one man went in and never returned. 
All right. Now someone's bringing in giants into the theory. Go listen to my episodes <laughs> on, on the whole theory of giants if you haven't yet. And yeah, it's like this whole theory keeps snowballing. So you can kind of see how like over the, I guess at this point, centuries now, like all these people kind of keep building on the hollow earth theory. At first it's like a, a number of spheres and then it gets whittled down to one. Somebody adds in the inner sun and then there's the entrances to the poles and then the advanced civilization that lives inside <laughs> so it's this is just wacky um and then by the time 1964 rolls around we get this book that's simply titled the hollow earth written by walter siegmeister under the pseudonym dr raymond bernard which talks about the fate of atlantis and this one brings flying saucers or ufos into the mix and the, the premise is similar to Lady Paget's theory that Atlantis survived underground in this subterranean utopia for all these thousands of years. And that the UFOs that we see today are actually Atlantean craft. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break here to talk about the Patreon. If you are not aware, Strangeology is on Patreon. And for an easy way to support the show, to support the Strangeology podcast, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash strangeology. I offer a wide variety of benefits and perks for members, starting at less than a cup of coffee per month. Some of these benefits include a permanent discount to my Etsy shop, VIP Discord access, early access to content, and members-only content as well, such as the Strangeology Beyond bonus extension to all of the shows, starting at episode 10 from season 1 exclusive members only merch shout outs and more and speaking of shout outs these awesome patrons help keep the lights on here at the strangeology podcast shout out to alex dorgan Alyssa, the mystic novelty company appalachian huntsman metazoo games greg morrill from all the weird sean cologne miranda jarnot john hickenbottom marine asmat prepared wolf gail frederick Adam Flynn, Connor Boyle, Ryan Holiday, Cassie Moratson, Ann Luchasakowski Ford, Roxy Roberge, Angie Fitz, MG, Adam Jenks, Mike Casey, Daniel Thorndike from Blue Room Insight, and Jeremiah Byron from the Bigfoot Society Podcast. So again, if you want to check out my Patreon, head on over to patreon.com forward slash strangeology. I very much appreciate it. And now, let's get back to the show. All right, we're back. So, we've got all these old, long-dead scientists and theologians and authors talking about what they think the true nature of the Earth is. But are there any accounts out there that could support this idea in real life? One of the major claims of this whole theory in modern times comes from Admiral Richard E. Byrd, who was a well-known 20th century United States Naval Admiral and Explorer, and it's all about his alleged mission to Antarctica. He was once quoted as referring to Antarctica as the land of everlasting mystery and of the Arctic. He once said, I'd like to see that land past the North Pole. It is the center of the great unknown. Now, people take these quotes to heart in terms of the hollow earth theory, like he knew something we didn't. But I think that this was probably just his adventurous spirit talking here. So... Bird died in 1957, and he was 68 years old and led a very full and adventurous life. He was a pioneering aviator, a 
Polar Explorer, of course, and organizer of polar logistics with the military. He was a decorated veteran, and he was even friends with Henry Ford. And Bird claims to have led the first expeditions to reach both the North and South Poles by air, although there is some controversy surrounding those claims, and and in the theme of this episode, he's most well known among the Hollow Earth community for allegedly discovering an entrance to it during an Antarctic naval expedition in the late 1940s based on this alleged diary entry that was somehow found. So how did this famous Navy admiral get to the point of leading expeditions to the Arctic? Well, I want to give you all a, well, I was going to say brief, but it's not too terribly brief background because whenever anyone talks about this part of the story, I feel like we don't get any kind of context for who Admiral Byrd was as a person and how he got to be in the position of leading this huge expedition to the South Pole. So bear with me for a few minutes here while we learn about Admiral Byrd. So to start, he joined the Navy around 1908 at age 20, and he has served on several U.S. ships over the years and eventually earned the rank of lieutenant junior grade. And over time, he would find himself in less strenuous roles due to a series of injuries that he sustained while he was in the, the Naval Academy. And near the end of his time being an active Naval officer, he actually landed uh, a job or I guess a, uh, a position serving on the presidential yacht before he was medically forced to retire from active duty uh, as a serviceman on uh, naval vessels. And that happened in 1916, right before uh, the United States entered World War I. So, Byrd wound up being reassigned to a desk job to oversee the mobilization of the Rhode Island militia when the U.S. entered the war in 1917 and was then put back into active duty stateside at this desk job organizing training camps for soldiers. And later that year, he was sent to Pensacola, Florida to complete aviation training and wound up getting transferred to a U.S. Naval Air Station in Halifax, Nova Scotia to command naval air forces there for the war effort. And it was there that he wound up becoming a permanent lieutenant and was also temporarily uh, given the, uh, the title or the rank of lieutenant commander. Now, after the war, a few years later, Byrd volunteered to attempt a solo transatlantic flight because he had this adventurous spirit. And uh, this was actually several years before Charles Lindbergh would make his flight. But Teddy Roosevelt Jr., who was the son of President Roosevelt uh, number one, you know, <laughs> the bully pulpit, <laughs> the bull moose, uh, who was the secretary of the Navy at the time. And he put the kibosh on that, citing something about the risk outweighing the benefits for, uh, <laughs> for the mission. And he was instead assigned to uh, attempt to fly this dirigible airship called the ZR-2. But uh, as it so happens... Bird wound up missing the train that would have gotten him to the airfield on time. And interestingly, in a kind of final destination kind of way, missing this train caused him to uh, not die that day because the ZR2 wound up breaking apart in midair and it killed 44 of the 49 crew members on board this ill-fated airship. So if he actually made it that day, he probably would have died. And he lost several friends on this mission, which turned him into this like safety first kind of guy in 
all future missions and expeditions that he might be involved in. A few years later, in 1925, he finally got to do something pretty cool, which was commanding the aviation unit for an Arctic expedition over the northern reaches of Greenland. And it was on this mission that he met this guy, Floyd Bennett, a Navy chief aviation pilot, and another pilot who was from Norway named Bernd Balkan, who would become his primary pilots in future missions to the North and South Poles. Floyd Bennett wound up being the primary pilot for a mission over the North Pole in 1926 that Bird was leading, and Balkan in 1929 when he first flew to the South Pole. So after his run over the North Pole in 1926, Bird became somewhat of a national hero and was promoted to the rank of commander, although there was apparently this dispute over whether or not Bird and Bennett actually flew over the North Pole that time. And in 1928, Bird had his first expedition to the Antarctic, but it wasn't until 1929, after the harsh winter down there, that his first flight to reach the South Pole happened. And the flight there took about 19 hours to complete. And although it was hard on the plane, they were successful with the mission. After this massive achievement, Bird was promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral, who he actually became the youngest admiral in the history of the U.S. Navy at that point, and only one of three naval officers to get to jump over the rank of captain. And I think there's a few other ranks after that. So he kind of pulled like a Captain Kirk (laughs) and went uh, from being like not even like an ensign all the way to like commanding a whole bunch of stuff. (laughs) Uh, So years later in 1934, he mustered up a whole bunch of political and public support to finance another expedition to the South Pole. And he again returned to Antarctica. And instead of flying over the continent this time, he actually spent five months during the winter at this installation called Advance Base, which was a meteorological station where he apparently almost died from carbon monoxide poisoning due to a poorly ventilated stove in the base. And he got out with his life, of course, uh, but thanks to the nearby base camp crew that managed to rescue him in time. And it, it actually took them a while to get to the base. They kept failing because of bad weather to to get there. But eventually they, they got there and just in the, the nick of time, he was pulled from the the base before he suffocated. And so a few years later, Bird was invited to participate in the 1938-1939 German New Schwabenland Antarctic Expedition. But uh, we'll talk about Nazis in Antarctica later. Bird declined, which was a good decision, of course. Uh, But he did make it back down there again in late 1939 and in 1940 in March he wound up getting recalled back to the states to active duty for naval operations I assume since World War II started in 1939 and even though the U.S. wouldn't enter the war until December 1941 after Pearl Harbor I'm guessing that the the military was preparing for action just in case uh, so after Pearl Harbor, Byrd continued to serve as an active duty officer in the Pacific Theater, planning missions and conducting island surveys, and was actually present during the surrender of the Japanese on September 2nd, 1945. All right, I know that was a, a long background, and thanks for bearing with me, but I've always wondered just who the hell is this Admiral Byrd guy, and why was he granted access to Antarctica, and why is he so important to this story? Was he some crazy out there, woo-woo guy that would have been prone to making up fantastical stories about Hollow Earth? 
Did he even have a connection to Hollow Earth? Should we be skeptical of this alleged account uh, of a diary entry? Sure, but I think it's more important to understand the context of the person. You know, we look at witnesses of like UFOs and other Fortean phenomenon, paranormal stuff, and historically, at least, most people who claim to experience something weird are considered crackpots unless they were someone who was supposed to have their head on their shoulders like a government or military official. So it seems that up to the point of Operation High Jump, which is the the big event that uh, Hollow Earth theorists point to, he had led an interesting and decorated life in the Navy, having served in both world wars and had already been to Antarctica a bunch of times, this place that's unforgiving and hard to get to. And, you know, like one of those times he almost died. So (laughs) I would think that, you know, if he had a legit diary entry, he wouldn't be making stuff up, you know? So we're going to fast forward now to 1946 after the war. And this is where we tie in the hollow earth theory. So then secretary of the Navy, Admiral James Forrestal had appointed Admiral Byrd to be the official in charge of the Antarctic developments project. And he was the perfect man for it in the eyes of Forrestal to lead a new and massive expedition to the South Pole, which was called Operation High Jump. Now, sidebar, according to another theory, uh, this uh, Admiral James Forrestal was allegedly part of the Majestic 12, which uh, I'll probably do an episode on that at some point. But basically, uh, MJ-12 was this clandestine group involved with uh, dealing with and covering up UFOs and aliens visiting Earth. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, uh, Operation High Jump would be Admiral Byrd's fourth expedition to the bottom of the world. Now, conspiracy theorists in the hollow earth and UFO communities point to this operation as a key event where the U.S. was supposed to be covertly infiltrating a secret underground Nazi base in Antarctica and to capture their flying saucer technology. But (laughs) what was this mission about, really? So, according to the historical record on this, uh, Operation High Jump was supported by a fleet of naval vessels called Task Force 68, which included 13 support ships, the flagship USS Mount Olympus, which is kind of an interesting name for the flagship in this context, and an aircraft carrier, the USS Philippine Sea, along with several helicopters, aircraft, and other support craft. And overall, there were 4,000 servicemen and officers who were involved with this expedition. On paper, the operation was conducted to train personnel and new materials in frigid zones, and as also a way to consolidate and extend American sovereignty over the largest practical area of Antarctica. And there was also training involved uh, to deal with the Soviets in case conflict broke out with them. And they were also tasked with determining how feasible it would be to establish permanent bases there and possible locations to do so, as well as conducting scientific surveys from geological surveys, meteorological, and testing out and surveying electromagnetic conditions at the pole. So this vast crew arrived at the Ross Ice Shelf on New Year's Eve in 1946 and immediately began flying survey missions and discovered a bunch of new mountain ranges, and they were just really mapping out this whole section of Antarctica that no one had ever done before. And according to the theory, in 1947, 
Bird supposedly logged this secret journal entry on February 19th, chronicling a recent survey mission that he took part in. And him and his radio man, or his pilot, uh, flew to the South Pole and apparently beyond to uh, (laughs) the Hollow Earth. (laughs) This is where the story gets crazy, right? And I'll preface this with saying that You know, there's no evidence that this journal entry is actually legitimate. And the first time it appeared was in this book uh, by Raymond Bernard, who I mentioned earlier, uh, that's his pen name, uh, called The Hollow Earth. And, you know, it's a simple, simple title, but it also had this really, really long subtitle to it called The Hollow Earth. The Greatest Geographical Discovery in History Made by Admiral Richard E. Byrd in the Mysterious Land Beyond the Poles. (laughs) And then there's a sub-subtitle, The True Origin of the Flying Saucers. Now, that's going to be like the longest book title ever. And this uh, Bernard was apparently a Martinist, a Rosicrucian, and allegedly a Templar. So (laughs) do with that info what you will. So back to Admiral Byrd. So... He's flying beyond the pole, supposedly, and the compass and gyroscopes start going haywire and they wind up having to use the sun as a compass that they have to navigate instead. And after some time, he begins to see this big mountain range in the distance. But strangely, it's filled with greenery, lush vegetation, rivers this entire almost tropical like ecosystem that should not be there since he was literally just flying over an ice continent. And now the external temperatures are reading the in the mid seventies Fahrenheit and there's animals on the ground below, some of which allegedly look like prehistoric, something resembling a woolly mammoth which, you know, went extinct tens of thousands of years ago. And he tries radioing back to the base camp, but can't make a connection for some reason. And they keep traveling further and further until this vast city comes into view. And that's when the plane's controls become unresponsive and Bird sees these strange saucer disc-like shaped craft on either side flanking the plane that they're in and strangely he notices that there are swastika symbols on these discs hold up (laughs) now things get even weirder a couple minutes later after being paced by these ufo looking craft a voice crackles over the radio in english but with a kind of german or nordic accent and they say Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral. You're in good hands. Meanwhile, Bird is freaking out because they have no control over the plane, yet it seems to be guided by some invisible force, like a tractor beam of some sort. So the plane finally lands, and Bird is met with this entourage of tall, blonde humans, and he notices that The structures of this city seem to be made of crystals that are pulsating rainbow colors, and he mentions this scene looking like something straight out of Buck Rogers or something. (laughs) Now, he and his pilot are then brought into some funky Frank Lloyd Wright-looking building and given some beverages to drink, which he describes as incredibly delicious, like nothing he's ever tasted before. And then the hosts come in to escort Bird, which he leaves his pilot behind to go to this meeting room. And after noticing that the walls in these hallways that he's going through, they seem like they light themselves. And there's these automatically opening doors and elevators and (laughs) everything just seems so advanced and futuristic to Admiral Bird. So, and he finally makes it to this meeting room and one of the hosts speaks and says that he will be 
meeting with the quote master. So he finally is introduced to this guy, some spiritual master type of person who is like, I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral, and goes on to explain that they let his plane through the hollow earth entrance because they know of the events that happen on the surface and they were aware of Admiral Byrd's notoriety and his noble character, apparently. So this master explains that his race is called the Ariani and that they are concerned with humanity's recent development and wartime use of atomic weapons. And after the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that we have reached the point of no return with a power that we should not have. And he goes on to say that their aircraft, which look like what we would call UFOs, he calls them uh, flugel rods. No idea how to pronounce that one, but <laughs> um, the these they apparently sent out the, these flugel rods, these UFOs, to try to make contact with humanity, but were just met with hostility and their ships were fired on and shot down. Uh, and this master character warned about the future of the human race and a coming dark age. And in the wake of <laughs> a nuclear conflict, only a few people would be left alive. And then the Ariani would once again help humanity recover and learn from its mistakes, which kind of indicates that this kind of stuff has happened before. And there's like a cycle going on or something like that. So after that stark warning and uh, a message left with bird to communicate with his uh, superiors and I guess the world at large, he was, uh, dismissed and escorted back to his plane with his pilot and they take off and wind up getting escorted by the flugel rods <laughs> and uh, they head back towards their base camp and over the radio as they're flying back to the surface they hear one of the, the pilots say we are leaving you now admiral your controls are free all vitas in <laughs> so okay it's like they're speaking german now where's this <laughs> where's this coming from it sounds kind of like a bad fanfic or maybe this is where james cameron got some ideas for the abyss or something <laughs> i don't know so after admiral bird returned to america when operation high jump was over he reported to the pentagon and apparently wound up being detained for almost seven hours, and he was interrogated by the top brass of America's security forces, as well as undergoing a medical examination. Afterwards, he was ordered to remain silent on all of this, of course, and apparently this journal was then confiscated by the government, but somehow it surfaced later. <laughs> So that's the story of Admiral Byrd and Operation High Jump. To me, I could see how this author, Raymond Bernard, could have completely made all of that up. Uh, he was probably aware of Admiral Byrd and his expeditions, but had this theory about UFOs coming from hollow Earth uh, with this hyper-advanced civilization and tried tying the Nazis into it too for some reason. I don't know. It seems... All pretty far-fetched. And another glaring plot hole, no pun intended, is that in his book, Bernard states that Admiral Byrd is at the North Pole in 1947 uh, when Operation High Jump actually took place at the South Pole. So I'm just going to go ahead and say that this one's debunked. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned earlier in the episode one aspect of this theory involves Hitler and the Nazis. The idea is that because Hitler was into the occult and may have had some connection to the inner earth people, he had some super secret fortress built in Antarctica as a place to 
regroup should the Nazis lose the war. There, they would commune with this hyper-advanced inner-Earth civilization to build Nazi UFOs, and they would then proceed to take over the world. Now, some theories say that he didn't actually kill himself in 1945 and fled to Argentina, and then the the hollow earth aspect of, of that theory is that he then hopped on a boat with some other high-up Nazi escapees uh, and headed to this base <laughs> at the South Pole. Uh, in fact, Germany didn't actually set up a permanent base in Antarctica until 1981, <laughs> almost 40 years after the end of World War II. Uh, and, you know, long after the death of Hitler in the fall of the Third Reich. So where did this idea of a Nazi fortress in Antarctica come from? Well, in mid-December of 1938, as you recall, uh, Admiral Byrd was invited to join this expedition. The ship MS Schwabenland departed from Germany on a mission to the South Pole. This mission was organized by a Captain Alfred Richer, who was a decorated naval commander for Germany during World War I, but was not a member of the Nazi party. And interestingly, he was actually married to a prominent Jewish artist. Uh, so there was a reluctance in appointing him to the mission uh, by the German high command and Hitler himself, but apparently they let him lead this mission anyway. According to the story, the ship had one Nazi officer on board, which was a, uh, a rule for any kind of mission like this, apparently. And the rest of the personnel on board were 82 scientists and enlisted crew. The parameters for this mission was to apparently survey and claim a chunk of the polar continent for Nazi Germany, as well as having an area to hunt whales so they could bypass having to pay other countries for whale oil, uh, like Norway, which the Germans used a lot of whale oil. Uh, and the primary reason is because Germans loved the product of margarine, which was back then made uh, with whale oil. Kind of weird, weird little factoid there. So uh, the MS Schwabenland and its crew arrived in the coastal area of Queen Maud Land after a month of sailing, and the scientists aboard the ship decided to name this section of Antarctica New Schwabenland, or New Swabia, as some people refer to it as, after uh, the ship, of course. Um, and the seaplanes that they brought along with them, I think they only had like two or three, were able to make a couple flyovers over the area to survey the land. And uh, the expedition ran into trouble. Uh, in one instance, a reconnaissance plane, one of these you know, seaplanes, uh, ran low on fuel during a mission out, and they had to drop all of their onboard equipment and cargo to lighten the aircraft to extend the fuel enough so they could return back to their base camp. And among this cargo dump was actually a box of small metal swastikas that were supposed to be dropped across uh, New Swabia to cement Germany's claim to the area. Like, oops, I guess they messed that one up. Uh, after this brief mission, they wound up heading back to Germany in uh, February. So there's uh, another thing that could have influ influenced this story that was Germany actually had a secret scientific base, but this one was actually in the Arctic, a uh, thousand miles from the North Pole, on an island very close to Soviet territory called Alexanderland. 
the Allies during World War II would intercept these strange signals that seemed to be coming from beyond the Arctic Circle, but they wrote it off as a curiosity, perhaps just some kind of natural phenomenon, because they couldn't really tell what these signals were. Uh, but it actually, these signals were coming from this secret German station on this remote island. Now, this base was apparently a weather station to predict weather for the German Navy in the Northern Seas during the war, and the Allied forces never knew about it for years. And because Germany had this station, they were able to avoid certain uh, storms and to kind of have a leg up on the Allied forces uh, while they were battling at sea. And... The, one of the big reasons why the Allies never found out about it is because crews for the station would be ferried in on German U-boats. So they were just kind of sneaking under the, the radar or, or sonar, I guess, if you will. Um, and as it turns out, the base was abandoned in 1944 because the crew were eating tainted polar bear meat, um, had some kind of... Uh, worms in it I guess and everyone got sick so and as it turns out the base wasn't even discovered until two years after the war in 1947 when it was spotted by a plane that happened to be flying over and it took until 1952 for the Soviets to even get up there to see what this base was so in the end no Nazis didn't build a secret base in Antarctica to plan their revenge on the world. All of these theories, and there are more that I haven't touched on, I'm sure, don't really add up for uh, Hollow Earth being a real thing. And I'm, I'm fairly confident that this conspiracy theory is nothing more than just a wild fantasy. And that, my friends, is where I'll be ending today's regular show. And man, what a wild ride that was. Hollow Earth has always been one of those super out there theories that intrigues me, even though I know there's no way it could be real. I guess there's just some kind of innate uh, childhood imagination of fantastical things out there, right? So I hope you enjoyed the background, the history, my analysis about this theory uh, to why it's, I guess, still draws people into it today. So, you know, it's a really wild out there idea, but it's kind of a cool idea, too. Um, but yeah, I remember back in the day wanting to name a band Hollow Earth, <laughs> but then it turned out that there was already a band with that name. I think they're still around. Uh, that's like <laughs> one of the worst parts of starting a band is naming it because most of the sweet names are already taken. <laughs> anyway, thanks again for listening to the show as always and supporting the podcast. It really does mean the world to me. And without your support of the show, I wouldn't be doing this or at least to the capacity that I, I've been doing it at. It's amazing that the show recently hit 20,000 downloads and uh, it's kind of funny at the same time my YouTube channel passed 2,000 subscribers the TikTok channel or page whatever you call it there passed 200,000 followers a lot of two numbers weird synchronicity I guess and a couple more things before I sign off today if you do enjoy the show, it would be super helpful for me if you could take a minute to leave the show a review over on Apple Podcasts and to share the show with your friends and family or anyone you think might be into this kind of stuff. Post it on your social media and get more people out there listening. Also, a reminder about my hotline number to call in with your cryptid, UFO, alien, or paranormal or otherwise encounter of the strange and unexplained 
and experiences. Uh, I'm looking for stories to do another episode featuring them. Uh, I recently got a few pretty, pretty interesting ones that came in to the voicemail, but I definitely need a few more to make it into a full episode. The number you can call is 802-448-0612. Again, that's 802-448-0612. The voicemail has a two to three minute time limit to it. So if your story does take longer than that, you can just call right back and pick up where you left off. And also, just a reminder to follow me on all my socials. You'll mostly find me posting on Instagram or TikTok these days uh, for daily to semi-daily updates, depending on how busy I'm getting this summer. (laughs) Might not be every day, but but we try. Sometimes your boy gets busy. (laughs) And you definitely want to follow me if you love merch giveaways, because I periodically will throw up contests where you can enter... To win for a chance to get some free Strangeology merch. Uh, And I've got a lot of it. So (laughs) definitely want to be there whenever it happens. And I haven't done one on TikTok yet. But I am putting some plans in place to try a giveaway out there soon. uh, Which (laughs) I think will probably be pretty wild since there's a lot of people over there and and things just go crazy there every once in a while and if you like merch you can check out my shop at strangeology.etsy.com I'm constantly adding in new designs and I don't know if I'll have it released by the time this episode drops but I've got a really rad new design coming down the pipes that I think people are going to lose their mind over the few people that I have shared it with uh, patrons and the like who get to get access to that kind of stuff early uh, have been glowing in their responses to it. So I'm pretty excited for for this next design to get released. All right. I think that's about it for now. For Patreon members, stick around after this short break where I'll be continuing the discussion on Hollow Earth and other people in modern times that have tried to attempt to find the entrance to hollow earth for themselves that's for strangeology beyond the members only portion of the show stick with me and until next time take care of yourselves and each other and keep it strange Hey everyone, thanks for hanging around for Strangeology Beyond. So, Hollow Earth, that's a really wacky theory, isn't it? 
uh, probably one of the more 